Uh, but we'll start off first in, you know, what excites you about AI and healthcare? I think that's something that we all really want to hear. Some of the excitement that's out there. Uh, great, Jeff. Go uh, ahead. And this is, uh, I'm a computer scientist, but this is brand just a little technology. closer to the mouth. Yeah. And what's that? Yeah, excellent. Really <laughs> close. Okay. Science. All right. Uh, computer scientists are always the worst with the new technology. Um, there are a lot of things that excite me about AI for medicine right now. Certainly two of the biggest um, impacts I'm excited about are for each of you, uh, things change so quickly that you need the opportunity to have the latest information uh, about the science, but also about the patient in front of you because the EHRs aren't always delivering that to you in the most helpful way. And AI has that has that power to uh, to sort through and give you the most relevant information for your decision. But also um, related to the conversation we were just having a, a moment ago, uh, meeting needs of underserved populations, getting around the world and, and providing higher quality uh, care in places where there are very few clinicians. That's really exciting. But also I just wanna take a minute and say, you know, broadly, I've been doing AI research for almost 40 years, and 50 years ago, there was all this promise of natural language translation, of automated theorem proving, of expert systems uh, in the clinic. And, um, and we've really turned a corner now where many of these things are either becoming reality or very close. And so it's a really exciting time. I do have to say, for almost 40 years, I heard AI is horrible, it's just not good enough. And we skipped right over AI is wonderful and went to AI is horrible, it's way too good. So I'm excited about us using AI for good and, and to help people. All right. Uh, again, Michael, it's interesting. Uh, I guess it's been a while since you've had a picture taken. Maybe next time we'll get you up there. But uh, well, like my driver's Actually, license. That's a pretty old picture. Um, there, the new picture's on the internet, but often people just pull that one for some reason. Uh, uh, we'll it, ask our it's okay. it's IT right. department here is our who pulled it up. But anyway, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, so there are lots of things that excite me about um, artificial intelligence. And I want to just say that I'm a biostatistician and machine learning has been something I focus on for the last uh, 15 years. So, so I'm sort of a junior compared to David here um, in my work in it, but I'm very interested in um, learning and uh, getting and how to use data. So that's been my area since I was for mm -hmm. about four years. Um, and some things that excite me right now are the ability to go beyond prediction when working with artificial intelligence. So one of the things that I work on is decision support. And you may have heard something, the concept of reinforcement learning. This is the underlying um, machine learning tool used for Deep Blue and other recent developments that have been able to become world champions at gameplay. Um, the challenge with working, applying those tech to tell, that technology to humans, of course, is that people, people are not like games. You can't just try a whole bunch of stuff. They'll die if you don't give them good treatment. You can't just experiment with everybody. And so off-policy reinforcement learning is a, is a tool that can be used with humans and patients. And it's shown a tremendous potential for solving some very difficult um, health issues and be able to go beyond prediction and give recommendations that have data support behind them in terms of the outcomes of the treatment. So that area is very, very exciting to me. Um, I also want to mention that there are very, very uh, many developments around that with large language models. Um, and I just want to say that we were just talking about a tool that our lab developed recently for a gestational prediction that can be deployed in under-resourced locations like Colombia, other parts of Africa, India, and other parts of the world. And uh, what's interesting is though, the goal of this, it uses a simple ultrasound, handheld ultrasound like a Bible fly, and uses an iPhone or other smartphone to give a prediction of gestational age. Um, but the, we took us a, a while to get it to actually work. And what we ended up doing was using a, a modification of transformer architecture, which involves attention, which is the basic ingredients for large language models. So even though it's, we're not using it for our language decisions, that technology has been used in other areas. There are many, many things that I think are happening and are going on. And I think there's a lot to be excited about. Thank you. Dr. Vail. Thank you. Um, so I am not a computer scientist or a data scientist. I'm a physician. And so I kind of 
think of it in very practical ways. Um, so as, as was mentioned, um, I started a company where we started recording doctor-patient conversations, thinking someday we would use AI to write notes. And uh, when we were first acquired by Nuance Communications, they're the makers of Dragon. Um, when we were acquired by them and I told them what we were building and what we wanted to happen, they said, okay, so you want the Harry Potter experience. You want the quill floating in the air, <laughs> writing your note for you. And I was like, yeah, that's basically exactly right. Um, and they said, well, that's going to take, you know, 15 years. The technology is nowhere close. That was 2017. And, you know, the technology today is actually really, really good. At, at doing exactly that, not in real time, it's asynchronous. So you have to, you know, finish your conversation with your patient and upload it to the cloud. Well, it's actually streaming while you talk to your patient, but you need to finish it. And then the large language model, transformer model will write the note for you. Um, and so that's a very practical use case, offload physician documentation to an AI. And so for me as a clinician, I think, you know, how do you continue down that path of offloading things that a physician, a nurse, uh, an MA could use their time doing what humans do best, interacting with other humans, and computers do best at crunching data, taking in data. Um, and so I'm, I'm very excited about kind of this new generation of large language models like GPT-4. I think there is, uh, and we'll we'll talk about this, and as as we talk about this today, there's a lot of caveats. There's a lot we need to be nervous about, anxious about how it gets used, use it in the right way. But I also think um, that we're at this tremendous part of the hype cycle, where there's so much hype around AI right now that you know, as many clinicians. People ask the question like, well, is this the last generation of physicians like we know them today? And I don't think that's the case at all. I think it's the last generation of clinicians that doesn't use AI in their day-to-day -day work um, as intimately as we will going forward. But it, it is only going to make our jobs easier and better and, and really <laughs> maybe band-aid some of the problems that the EHR has given us over the last decade. So I'm excited. So I mean, I mean, I used Natural Dragon too, and so I'm, I'm pretty impressed how it's advanced each year. We're really recognizing a lot of terminology, you know, medical terminology now, I guess, with the upgrade. How many of you out there use voice recognition in your notes or Dragon or anything? I mean, that that's AI for you. Now, it's really interesting that you can't really show inflections yet. You know, like the word, really? 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 I mean, I mean, you can, see, you can say it, it means different things, but I think that's coming about as well. But you made a good question. There are a few things that we have to be cautious about. So I guess it's a good segue into what scares you the most about AI and healthcare? I mean, I think you already mentioned, no, I don't think we're going to be replaced, but are we going to be reduced? What scares you the most in AI and medicine? So I, uh, at lunch, I was using the analogy to self-driving cars, and um, there's a lot of promise there for great safety, but there have been a lot of uh, serious accidents and, and fatalities. And I think, um, I think the risks, especially with AI in healthcare, are that um, we might be using a model that's not as good as we think it is. And I'd be using the model like in the self-driving car case, where things have gone wrong is when a new situation never encountered before comes up. And so if you're taking this model into a new environment, a new set of events that's very different, um, the performance might not be as good. In the, yes, going in and out on the Back in the early 90s, AI started getting applied quite a lot to basic science data and this whole field we call bioinformatics. And there, I think the risks were lower because there was a longer pathway before a discovery or false discovery got translated into patient care. Uh, but what we saw happen is, uh, is that a lot of people would fall into some very subtle traps. And just to give one of many possible examples, um, they would do some 
uh, feature selection or, or picking a subset of variables, looking at their whole data set by which ones are correlated with the class. And then they run a really pure uh, train test split, build their predictive model, test it. Uh, but it turned out it wasn't nearly as good as they thought it was because the original feature selection had uh, inadvertently, really, it had peaked at the labels of the test data ahead of time. And that's one of many pitfalls that, that people fall into. And there are risks that this can happen with clinical models, many of these other pitfalls, uh, where we think a model is predicting causally, but it's just making a prediction, and we apply it in a new scenario. Uh, that's one of the big risks that really worries me, is that we'll translate models into the clinic too early or with too much confidence in them. Well, there are a bunch of things that scare me. I could probably talk for hours on this, but um, I'll just narrow it down to one or yeah, two. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry, I, I'm going to do that. So, um, I think there's two things. Um, I'm going to talk about. I think both are just different sides of this of this coin. One is the thing that scares me a little bit about large language models. They're very, very powerful, um, and the underlying architecture is amazing. But it's important to remember that there are really intense limitations. Um, just a reminder, what the large language model ChatGPT4 does is it uses data from all of the internet, uh, you know, all of the internet. But that's its strength and its weakness. So, for example, so this morning in my lab, we talked about large language models. That was a topic. We had a, one of our students who specializes in this gave us a presentation. We had a discussion. Uh, one of the things we tried to do is see if the uh, ChatGPT could tell the difference between numbers two, three, four, and seven, and so on. Like write a write a seven word haiku, okay? It couldn't do it reliably. It's it's rely it's looking at word relationships, but it has very great difficulty with arithmetic. Unless you set it set it up the right way, it can then answer your arithmetic question question correctly. But it can't really process and make it into a story problem that can be solved in a very effective way. So it has these really interesting limitations. Um, and it has to do with how it's trained. It's not inherently done, that, nobody's done anything wrong. It's just that we assume it's smarter than it is. And there's some things that we really can fail at. And so I think we have to be very, very careful as we develop these things, to test them, and to make sure that they are working in the context we think we are. The other concern I have that's sort of related to this also is the ease with which you can do some things with ChatGPT4. Um, it can help you write papers. It can help you do many other things. Um, it can make up citations for you that don't even exist, but your paper will look great. Um, but one worry I have is that suppose those problems are ironed out. People could become so reliant on it that they don't actually learn the underlying principles or develop critical thinking capability, which you absolutely need in whatever endeavor you're doing. And I worry that there's a possibility of people beginning to do stuff that looks good but they don't actually understand what they're doing and it, it ends up failing in frightening ways. You know, I saw a cartoon just recently and it says, are you worried about the advances in AI? And the person says, no, I'm worried about the decrease in natural intelligence. <laughs> I mean, that's what we're starting to see. Next. Yeah, I mean, okay. what am I most worried about? I, I watched Terminator. That's what I'm most worried about. <laughs> um, but no, <laughs> really, um, I, I, also love the self-driving car analogy um, for many reasons. Uh, one is if we had a nation full of self-driving cars today and they were all using the same model and they all had the same bug and they all caused the same accident, that's something bad at scale. And so I worry about it, that in AI because um, people will argue, well, self-driving cars today are probably safer than humans. But one bad human can only kill, you know, so many people in a car. Um, one bad algorithm can have a huge impact. And so that's where I think the difference in, you know, badness, the scale is, is really important to take into account. Um, number two, I, I agree with Dr. Kosserock on, uh, you know, the impact on just general intelligence. I think what we will see um you know there was this paper that came out i think mckinsey did it that said you know experts using gpd4 were this much better than experts alone and i think that that's probably true 
And we'll continue to see this separation of experts plus AI are better than humans alone. Um, what I do worry about is that we don't get as many people to that expert level. And what, what these large language models are particularly good at is being mediocre at everything. Um, and so it's incredible how, you know, it, it can pass the bar, it can pass the USMLE, it can do all these things. But when you dig in and you really try to push it, it's kind of mediocre at everything. So then I worry, well, do we end up with, you know, generations of people who are kind of just mediocre and we don't have, you know, extraordinary uh, knowledge like we have in the past. Um, so, yeah. And like, like Michael, I could, I could go on and on, but I'll, I'll stop right there. That's, those are a couple of my worries. Yeah. <clears throat> interesting. You mentioned the term, and I watched the Netflix not too long ago and they were look, talking about the advances in medicine and how they were using AI to look at different sites, you know, for chemicals and stuff that can be more potent and, and safer. And then they changed the zero to a one. I don't know if you saw that. And all of a sudden it went in reverse overnight. And what it, they came out the next day was 4,000 of the most toxic chemicals known, even worse than sarin and then what we nerve, you know, nerve gas and stuff like this, just by changing a zero to one which was pretty amazing when I saw that. So I guess my question would be that since we're starting to incorporate AI in the, in the medical uh, profession, you know, if something bad goes wrong, who do we hold accountable? What do you say about that? Dr. It's, it's a great question. And I think that, um, that the developers of the AI system will be held at least partially accountable, but I think there will always be- But we pushed the button and we yeah, just made that decision and gave that prescription. Right. I think there'll always be a clinician in the loop and I think the clinician is going to be held accountable too, fairly or not. And uh, and I think we will see um, see this tested out eventually in the courts where, um, where the case is brought against both the clinician and the algorithm developers and the courts will decide but uh i think there's going to be i think both are going to be held accountable uh there's certainly uh a lot more money at the uh at the algorithm developer big company level and so um so the malpractice premiums will be higher there uh, huh? <laughs> i expect so uh, yeah this is a good question because one of the things that we have with our current market system and this is the cynic, the cynic coming out in me is that it tends to enable that people begin to be more and more separated from what they're responsible for there's fewer people that are account how it can be held accountable for different things um, an example is um, our family recently stayed at a summer uh, at, on, on the beach in a, in, in, a, in a home there rented a home airbnb and um, it was not very clean so we we talked to people and it turned out the owner came out to sort of with some people to fix it well they have a management company but they only work certain times and they're able to set it up so the management company isn't really accountable for it and the owner has to be if they want to have a good reputation of the house so that seems like there's some separation now the purpose of the long story is not to talk about how i spend vacations and the decisions i make whether they're good or bad but um it's this tendency in the market to separate accountability in very clever ways and I worry that we're going to have it so that it, people won't be able to be held accountable for these things, which means that some things won't change or bad things will happen before they change. So I'm a little bit worried about the way we hold people accountable itself, that with AI, it's a new thing. We might, we might have a little more trouble. So. Yeah, I think um, for now, it will... There are a few AI tools used today that don't go through the physician to sign off. And so for now, the physicians would be held accountable. Um, I, I agree, you know, Microsoft and, and uh, Google have much more money to go after, but I think that uh, the way they offload risk is saying, we're always going to have a doctor in the loop. We're going to have the doctor look at it. Um, and I don't know about you all when in Epic, of course, or whichever EHR you use, 
is using some rules-based AI in the background to help you know if there's a drug-drug interaction or whether there is an allergy or something else you should be thinking of. And, and these are getting somewhat more complex, but still fairly rudimentary, but they'll become much more complex. And what becomes a problem is they start to have more data being processed in them than we can hold in our brains. So, you know, I'll, I'll take a fairly simple one, but it's going to become much more common, uh, pharmacogenomics. So as more people get their full genomes done, and, you know, the federal government has a whole website set aside that tells us about pharmacogenomics and tells us if you have a certain uh, variant, then you should be on a lower dose of statin, or you shouldn't be on Plavix or whatever. Those things, I don't know how many of us are going to memorize all the pharmacogenomics, and it's going to change every quarter the, the website gets updated, and they update those recommendations. Epic will push those, or whatever EHR will push those. And we're going to be the ones held accountable in the end. Did we, you know, did we change the drug order? Was it correct? And so I think there are some real hard questions we need to ask. We need to ask at our practice level or at our hospital level about the tools we're adopting and how, how that accountability is going to be held. Because at the bedside, that's where we're making the decision. Um, you know, the, the tool we built... Uh, Dragon Ambient Experience. So you finish your conversation, you get this note rendered seconds after. And one of my biggest concerns was it was so good that if you didn't check it 100%, you might miss that it said, you know, this person does or does not have something. And we all know that just one simple word yes or no changes everything about that patient's medical history and their current care. So there, that is my other concern is as we get closer to 100%, do we pay less attention? Um, and I used to often argue, well, we're gonna have to make sure, like maybe we have to put artificial errors into these notes. So that, you know, if we take it to 100%, are, are the doctor is gonna always but if they always know there's five words in there that are wrong, and so they have to go in and correct them. Um, and, and so, yeah, that's those are some of my concerns. Yeah. All right, that's uh, you know, those are the three major questions that I had, and we can talk a little bit about the ethics. But I think you guys sort of you know entertain that. Uh, I'm sort of worried that sometimes that these insurance companies will start you know denying things, or basically, I mean, now you can order a whole antibiotic kit online without even you know seeing a physician just in case something bad is going to happen from the middle east and you have all the supplies so more and more uh, our patients are having access to stuff without being vetted by a physician uh, genomics is another thing is all my patients i've done their genes at least what we know today and we know that there are other genes we haven't found yet with drug interactions and stuff but i know what not to give them not necessarily what to give them about if i met it saying there's you know metabolize at a very fast rate, uh, things like this. And that's being incorporated in my EMR, so it's sort of neat, you know, not only I can see drug interactions, but also how a patient metabolizes. So I think AI in that way, but I still make the final decision, but I could see insurance companies taking me out of the loop and making the final decision what they're trying to do with what I can prescribe and what I can't prescribe. So we got about almost 30 minutes. And I, I hope we have a, a lot of questions out there. If not, I, I have a few myself, but, uh, have we held up some uh, have a, some card for our panel? Yeah, I got one one question over here. Oh. Hey, um, thanks. That was really interesting. I'm more, uh, you know, because I'm not a physician, but I'm more taken aback by it than I am happy about it um, because I see. I see the benefits for sure, but I see way more the negatives than two of the ones that you guys have brought up, which I think are going to be a big deal. It's going to be accountability and insurance. It's going to be because they're going to find a way. They're going to find a way. So I guess my question becomes, let's say you're in an AI situation and it's clinical and you guys know far more about this. So speaking of the Terminator then, is there a, sh I'm being for real when I say this, because I'm clueless when it comes to, 
can you shut it? Can, is there a shutoff valve? I mean, it's serious to God. Like if, if you were doing something in medicine and it was AI generated and you're going, whoa, 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 it's putting the gallbladder. That's not what I wanted it to do. You know, is there a shot? Can you make it stop? Can you make an AI stop what it's doing? Yeah, you can absolutely put that in. But the worry is, um, does someone not put it in? Or in the Terminator scenario, is there long term? Is there a right. back door for it to get around that? Switch? Exactly. Is there a way to get around the switch? Yeah. Right. So that's why I'm nervous about it. I mean, I see so many benefits. But I, as soon as, and then you get all excited, we get excited about it. And then as soon as he says the words accountability and insurance, my brain immediately goes from the business side of it going, that's exactly where the problem is going to come from in my brain. And I just want to say, I agree with having fears as long as they don't overwhelm us, but they can help us guide towards the things that we should care about as we ask the questions of how can these things be useful. Um, we had it before we started this panel, we had a little discussion among us about uh, a tool that we've been, our lab has been developing uh, for gestational age prediction, just using a handheld butterfly and a smartphone. And its accuracy right now is the same as the expert. Um, however, one one thing that we're, the, the safety can go in the other direction. In this case, the idea for the, is for this to be deployed in under research locations where they don't have a physician they may have a mid nurse midwife. They may not even have that. Can Will it be safer to use this than nothing at all? And the answer is probably we're doing field tests right now to make sure. Because we're, we're also, as we, all of the, I think all of us in this group have done some development in this. And one of the things that I think we all have is a little fear. We want this to work when we develop something. Now, not every, you know, in we, we really want it to work, but we want, and we have all these fears that keep us up literally at night. How do we make sure it's going to be safe that these things don't go wrong? And I think on the other side of it, you can ask is, are things going to, are there some situations where it would be much better to actually have it, even given the risks, not that we should ignore the risks. And so I just want to raise that point. But I think the thing that we have to do is not not do it, but do it safely with intent. That's the thing we have to do and set up a system that allows us to address these concerns in advance. Yeah, I mean, you know, some of the questions out there, I think you guys are addressing and stuff, but it's sort of interesting how I got several about the uh, no option. What happens if no option is offered and we're forced to end this algorithm, uh, things like this. Again, I think uh, that's sort of a, a scary scenario that there should always be. That's one nice thing about emotions. They're not logical. So sometimes we don't apply logic to our patients because we know them better. But they were worried a little about if no option is offered, you know, in the algorithm, how do they manage the patient? Um, the other thing I know is that, uh, you know, we had a, a bad storm that went through Hickory not too long ago, power went out, okay, we had some emergency lights went on, and then they said, well, I guess we have to close my staff, I said, no, <laughs> We're gonna get paper, pencil and paper, you know, that's how we used to do it, and we can populate the computer after we get our power off. Um, the cable went out in, in our office, you know, I, I was lucky to pull up my iPad so I could go sell your and uh, open up some notes on another day, so I think these people, and I can see, we're worried about, and you mentioned it better, we're going to be so dependent on AI, just like we're dependent on our EMRs now, that when the power goes out, what happens? So I guess the question here is that, again, if there's no option offered to, to the algorithm, who's going to manage the patient? Any uh, <laughs> insight there? Yeah, I mean, don't forget how to call consultants and I'm an <laughs> ER doctor, so I'm always just calling the consultants. Um, but yeah, don't forget how to practice medicine. Um, I think, you know, the the connectivity issue is a real issue. Luckily, our good friend Elon Musk is going to solve that for us all with Starlink. Um, only partly joking there. Um, but I, I do think, you know, it, there is no going back from technology and medicine, both for rep record keeping um, and for care management. Um, and so what I what I recommend for, especially for uh, management and physician groups is learn about it, become involved. Um, and as was stated with insurance companies, so I had the, the luck, I guess, of being at Microsoft a year ago when they first got access to GPT-4 and from GPT-3 to GPT-4, 
was a giant leap in in how good the large language models were and so right away when i was playing with it i was writing prior authorization letters and doing all the things that now you've seen on the internet and of course like as soon as the business development person saw it they said oh i should go talk to the insurance company so they can answer that letter and so yeah absolutely everything and was like you talked about what we can make these algorithms discover drugs or toxins. Um, we can make these algorithms help with care or, you know, add to the administrative burden instead of decrease the administrative burden. Um, and so I think that what's best for all of us is for us to become somewhat expert, at, at least to be keeping tabs on it so that we can advocate for ourselves so that, you know, we're not left having other people make decisions for us. And in becoming somewhat experts, I think a lot of this is becoming policy experts because that's a lot of what we're talking about rather than the technology itself. But also I teach a class where we cover how uh, transformers work and how GPT-4 works and, and all of that. But But it's been striking to me that this is the first kind of algorithm where I see people more effectively learning its strengths and limitations by just using it rather than learning all the details of how it works. I think you don't have to know all the details of how it works to really learn about it. And you learn things like without further training it by learning the weights in the neural network, it essentially learns just with what's called uh, K-shot um, learning or K-shot use where you essentially uh, just have your dialogue with it and it gets better in the process of having that dialogue because it has more of your input that it can attend to, uh, even though it hasn't changed its weights at all. So just um, experimenting with chat GPT or some of these systems is a great way to learn what they can and can't do. The only thing that I wanted to add, which is maybe a little bit off left to left field here, that is the importance of of thinking about how to carefully and thoughtfully evaluate the performance of AI in a way that address some of the risks and concerns in advance, or ways to set up continual monitoring of it. Because even if we're conscious, we can't ever, we can't always know everything about something. And so I think that working together with other groups, developing methods that evaluate just not, not just immediate performance, but long-term performance uh, and consequences of things, evaluation, smart evaluation can really help us stay ahead of the problem, I think. Thank you very much. I mean, you know, a lot of these questions were parallel. So what I just mentioned to you, um, <clears throat> they're worried about, oh, well, you know, this drug is now indicated for this disease. It's put in the arm room, and then the next day there's some toxic effects. So now we got to pull it and they're worried about keeping up with it, but hopefully there'll be some type of issue there. Uh, our CEO, who's our one of our IT person, that's what he was before him. He said, "I got a question. I got a question." I said, "I said, okay. Well, you got the mic, well, so we'll give you the question." And I apologize okay. if you've already addressed this because I was late getting back here. But um, okay, you're good. Is uh, how transparent is the algorithm? Who owns it? Like, who will continue to keep up the rules? Um, and what's the clinical oversight over the programming that takes place? So, who owns it, and how transparent is the development? I might give you a turn, but I'll take a shot. There's the transparency of the development process and the evaluation, like Michael was talking about. Uh, and then there's the transparency of the algorithm itself. And, you know, in medicine, um, algorithms have been used for years, scoring models. And, uh, and when you've got a simple uh, logistic regression of a few variables, a scoring function, or even a small decision tree, we can say that's transparent, but these deep neural networks like GPT-4 are anything but transparent. And, yeah. uh, one of my friends, Rich Caruana, for years has told the story of how back when neural networks were much simpler, they just had one hidden layer. They were still kind of hard to understand, and they were about to translate a model into the clinic, um, and he realized like the night before this goes in, goes live, he realized essentially what that model was doing was recognizing the patients who were in the worst shape 
and that they got all this great care and did very well. And it was about to say, don't worry about those patients, they'll be fine. Uh, and the model uh, was anything but transparent and that's only gotten worse. And I guess that's sort of, is kind of staying on that same logic is um, a lot of the communications and the, the news that we get now is syndicated from BUC and get into the system and then it's repeated out everywhere like oops so it's that same mindset that we get too reliant on that and what the transparency is and how you look oversight i'm sorry Go ahead. Yeah, yeah i think this is a really really good point i the importance of transparency evaluation and somebody who's kind of watching it so uh, and i also want to mention um so one analogy that may or may not be helpful here is the way that drugs are evaluated, we have phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four trials. And so one like could that. think of the idea of a phase three trial would be like field trials, which we've been doing with our device. And phase four is your continual monitoring of its performance as it goes to different populations. Yeah. Like well, that's what you really need is to set up some sort of method of continually uh, monitoring it. I like that, yeah. Um, but this is something, that, you know, it sounds sensible, right? There is no written guidelines anywhere for this yeah. right now. There's no <laughs> agreed upon policy or procedure. This sounds good from an academic conversation, but who's enforcing this? Who's encouraging? Who's who's organizing this? That's that's a, that's an open question. Uh, the other thing is the idea about interpretable AI, where it, you try to interpret it yourself. It itself. I think that there is tension here because sometimes we can't we don't understand every drug mechanism before and every mechanism thing that happens with our treatments. We still don't. Some of them we have a really good idea, but a lot of them we don't. And so I think interpretability, I think transparency of the process is more important than understanding the model. Sometimes there is no good solution that's readily interpretable, right? Yeah. But you can check it and you can be honest about how it's being checked. And I, so I would say that I think interpretability is valuable when you get it, yeah. but if you, of the model itself, but I think the process being um, transparent and checked is even more important. Yeah, there was a, a statement here talking about uh, insurance companies. Someone said they read an article where they're going to start using AI to uh, basically, of course, reduce expenses and splitting these profits, of course, with the decreased cost of the physician. And then they talk about how ethical is this going to be. And also, I know in the military, uh, we did triage all the time, and we have resources. We only have this much resources. So very quickly, we had to black tag somebody or red tag. In other words, because we do have resources that have to be used versus using all those resources just on one person, we can keep three others alive and things like this. And these are really hard ethical decisions, but with an algorithm, that I think that's what they're worried about is like, oh, well, this person has a, a, a bunch of comorbidity is going to cost us a lot. Let's just go ahead and in our algorithm, not give them anything, expedite you know, the inevitable, then we can make that money towards these other people that are going to be live longer to pay those profits or things like that. So that was one thing that they were worried about. I mean, can you foresee something like that? So one of the, one of the related uh, questions is uh, ethics of your, are the uh, consequence of your uh, AI tool on uh, uh, marginalized groups? Yeah, that was my fourth yeah, yeah. question right beside us. So, one thing that one has to be very careful about is some of these models preserve bias that currently exists in its worst okay. way. They, they preserve it, they don't change it. We don't want socially irresponsible AI, right? We just don't want that. And so this means that we have to do more work and evaluation. We have to check. Is, this, is there any underrepresented group that this is going to be unfair? And that should be transparent. If an insurance company is doing something to save money, they're not being transparent, and there's a couple of marginalized groups that are really getting uh, treated badly, then that's not something we want to have happen. That, that kind of scares me, the possibility. So yeah, I think you really have to have, be very careful about having biases preserved in the AI and then unintended uh, consequences. Can you really have AI be ethical? I mean, that's what I think, because it's so I mean, logical. Yeah, so the, the evaluation process, you, you, your simple things are you, you could feed data into it and see which groups are being affected. So this is a very, I mean, it doesn't say, you have to have data to do that, of course, but you can often have test cases that you're working with and you can just make sure that that's inclusive or the population is very inclusive. But having, it sounds easy when I say it, but having to set up that study and having people support the value of those studies, that's the hard part. It really has to happen.
Um, I don't know if someone else wanted to talk about that. Oh, we have a question out there in the audience. I want to say uh, I've been using that DAX nuisance dragon, and it's excellent. Okay. A talking phone gets typed up by someone else. Now, now it's done by two people. It's done by a scribe and then a paster. Okay. So in the future, is this going to be typed up by AI? And then AI kind of scares me a little bit because, you know, I'm, I'm a little worried about having things done by maybe a computer thing, not being done like that. Yeah, so I am i don't work with DAX anymore, uh, but they did just release Copilot, which is in family medicine and orthopedics, and that is 100% AI. There's no human in the loop. Um, and so it's on the physician to check it and, and sign it off. Yeah. He said they just have to check behind it. I, I do check behind it because they do. They yeah. will say did, do, and did not. It will mess up. They do that on purpose, <laughs> just so you'll check. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We have some more questions. Oh, we got one more. Yeah. I just wanted to ask, uh, should I be telling the students now to stay away from any of the specialities that might be taken over by AI? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't see that happening for any of them. Uh, I will say that most of the translated medical successes so far, and, and I'm super excited about the ones around uh, around clinical notes, but most of them have been with image data, and um, and so the radiologists maybe are at the most risk. But uh, but I don't see any of them needing to worry. I think the reason the successes have been with image data so far are that first of all, um, those data are maybe more objective than than um, than the note or not the notes, but the the coded data in the EHR because that has to interact so much with insurance company with with payers and and how there are many ways things can be coded, uh, but also the early successful deep neural network algorithms, the first ones were convolutional neural networks, which were tailored to image data. So um, I think all areas are going to be affected, but I don't see any of them in, in risk of uh, becoming obsolete. Yeah, unless, unless Michael keeps uh, figuring out how to make it so you don't need radiologists. No, uh, when, you know, Michael and I have known each other for a few years, and when people ask me what he works on, I say, you know, someday you're just going to be able to rub ultrasound on somebody, and it'll just read everything for you to tell you what it, tell you what you just saw. Um, but yeah, I think in the in the next generation, there isn't really a fear of any specialties becoming obsolete. And I agree that imaging is, I mean, that's, if you look at the FDA approved AI algorithms, imaging by far has the most FDA approved algorithms. What I do think we're going to start seeing, and I'm surprised we don't see it yet, is health systems advertising your radiologist and an AI read your, you know, whatever, your mammogram, your chest x-ray, your whatever. And we, we really don't see that yet, but I think that will be a differentiator. Yeah, I mean, I know the, the like colonoscopies now. I mean, it, it, they're using AI to, to pick up little things that they yeah. might not have detected come out. And when you see your colon, you know, this big on a screen, and then now you can start seeing AI I can pick those things up. Uh, skin lesions, I think there's been an FDA approved now for melanoma and things that we can actually use on our phone, uh, which I think is pretty neat. But then again, if you miss it and you used it, you know, <laughs> who's finally responsible? I mean, I use up to date. Somebody talked about that as well. If they mess up, you're not going to sue up to date. They're just giving you guidelines, not necessarily standard of care. And he's worried more about forced standard of care from AI. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, do you think that's ever going to come about? I mean, I wanted to, I, that's a good question. I think that that's a risk, right? I wanted to, I wanted to answer that, our previous question. Okay, I apologize. Little, okay. No, 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 no. no. Um, the... The thing I want to say is I don't think I think those all the specialties that we're aware of will continue. What I think might change is the way people might work together in team science types approaches, which may involve more people with hybrid tech, uh, abilities in terms of people that have AI skills or even deep architecture AI related skills. Um, 
and you'll and, and so the kind of way we work may change a little bit because we want to effectively bring this AI in. We may have different expertise represented in addition to what we have. But I think that if done right, all of this all of this AI tools can enhance what we're doing and make it more interesting to them. Um, but yeah, so I so kind of give that. Yeah, somebody told us earlier about embracing AI because of how it, it gives us a lot more data that we can, our brain can process to make a better educated decision. You know, and I think that's something that was discussed earlier before this month. Yeah, I do worry about us letting get into a point where AI is making decisions for us. And this is where I think the evaluation is really important. Um, you, if, if a decision is made solely on whether or not you make money, I think you'll see a lot of AI is making decisions for people. And so what we have to do is just make sure that decision-making process incorporates healthy perspective into these things so that this doesn't become uh, you know, a, a nightmare because uh, I think that's what could happen. So I think it depends on how we're able to purposefully, intently, intentionally um, make sure that the decision-making is done in, with the right people, right stakeholders. I think we could address, we could prevent that from happening. You know, I always tell my patients uh, they 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 know themselves better than any physician ever will. We'll try to help them understand what their body's telling them. But then again, garbage in, garbage out. So if they tell us the wrong thing, we put that in. AI is going to spit out something, and then oh my gosh, you know what kind of treatment is that going to be? So that's also feeding the information into the system. I think that's very important. And as clinicians, we have to make sure we give the. <laughs> the right information, not the wrong information that somebody else might get. So. Well, I think that was sort of the basis for my question is, yeah. <laughs> is the decision support based on, you know, quality outcomes or financial. Yeah. So oversight with, you know, physicians and what's going on and rules are built into it and how that happens, that process you were talking about. Yeah. All right, so we got about three or four minutes, maybe time for one or two others. Uh, we have one in the background over there. Oh, that one. Over here. Okay, what's, you get that one, second. So two, and that will be our final one. Thank you. I was uh, at another conference on this topic a couple of weeks ago, and uh, some senior HHS people were there. And I think there's some issues with different frames of references from all the different stakeholders. So their look at this was maybe we can recoup some money for fraudulent uh, activities out of this. And um, just like templates are being used now, and you put WNL, um, meaning within normal limits, they're going to interpret that as um, we never looked. Yeah. And um, they're looking at this strictly from the bureaucratic um, <clears throat> regulator point of view. And there's also some other um, legal issues uh, underlying some of this as well. So uh, I think that was one of the things that happened with the initial uh, EMRs and EHRs was there were a lot of different stakeholders and they got crossed up on the issues of what our primary directive is. And I think the other issue I've come across is there's going to be some system failures in all of this and how do we get through those or around them or whatever as well. And we have one final one. Wow. I'm finding this exciting and enlightening. Hopefully, you all as well uh, will be finishing up. Go ahead. Uh, so, my question really revolves around like the time differential learning of AI. From my understanding, like what I had read on Gary Kasparov in Deep Blue, that AIs are very good at basically savant type stuff where the learning environment is kind, where the rules are repeatable, chess, those kind of things. And they're not very good at, say, civilization, where strategic thinking is really involved. So the when I'm just kind of wondering, predictive, because you guys are experts in the field, like when will it kind of phase over or when do you guys think it will phase over where the AIs are doing like the things where the learning is kind, right? Like reading a CBC over and over again is a kind learning environment. The, and that we're kind of overseeing that as the strategic thinkers, because I think that's probably where it's headed. I just don't know how long that's going to be. So, Tommy, what do you think? I mean, I mean, I look at my phone, how fast it advanced. I'm, I'm trying, and this is really interesting, the idea of a kind environment. 
I actually think we want AI to be able to learn in unkind environments, right? That's what we really want it to do. And I would that's I, I made a kind of probably hyper technical comment early on about off policy reinforcement learning. That's um, a method of reinforcement learning different than Deep Blue that was used for Deep Blue that allows for very un, fairly unkind but realistic learning environments. But there's still limitations. But I, I just want to say there are AI experts who are asking the question you asked and looking at how do we make sure this stuff works and how do we check to make sure it's it's performing well, or at least we know its limitations when we have un, unkind environments, but we have to learn anyway. So. Well, uh, I, I definitely thank. I think it's been very informative. Uh, we're going to have to be moving on, but uh, I know you traveled a little bit to get here, and we appreciate it at SMA. And I know hopefully we'll have more of these type of conversations in the near future. So I think we should give them a nice round of applause. Wow, where's Rob? For those that you don't know, Rob's back here. Uh, he's the one handling everything. And uh, he, he's been very instrumental at SMA uh, for numerous things, getting projects uh, started up. Uh, the sounds you hear in the background, the pictures that you're going to be seeing, and a lot of our uh, marketing. So he'll be introducing our next uh, speaker. Hey, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, like, like Dr. Carter said, my name is Rob Ingram. and um, I'm the marketing director here, um, and I'm very not very novice or I don't, I'm very very amateur at this over here. So uh, I hope that you'll forgive any technical difficulties we may have this weekend. <laughs> but um, I am uh, where is my where do I Let's see on the other side? Okay, there we go. Dr. Christopher Jackson, SMA President Elect. We'll moderate this session, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Pragna Patel, the Chief Medical Officer at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Patel will be discussing COVID-19 testing and treatment. Welcome, Dr. Patel. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> Is this better? That's better? Yeah. Okay, so it's such a pleasure to be here today. Um, thank you for uh, to the organizers for inviting me to speak on COVID-19 testing and therapeutics. So just the objectives of the talk today is to update you on um, current COVID-19 epidemiology, talk a little bit about emerging variants, understand some of the nuances with COVID-19 testing, uh, and give you a pretty comprehensive overview of COVID-19 therapeutics uh, with a focus on outpatient treatment and a review of risk factors for disease, which I know has been sort of a confusing area. Um, we'll talk a little bit about viral rebounds and then a few slides on long COVID. So let's start with the EPI. So this is our latest COVID-19 new hospital admissions and the percent of emergency department visits uh, diagnosed as COVID by week. And so, as you can see, the yellow line is the COVID-19 um, ED visits, and the blue are the hospital admissions. They track pretty closely together. 
we're following ED visits and hospitalizations right now because our case report reporting has fallen off a bit, partly because testing practices across the country changed and there was a lot of home-based testing. And then with the end of the PHE, a lot of the requirements for reporting to CDC also changed by state. So those data are not quite as um, useful. But the ED data and the hospital data give us a sense of severe disease or at least medically